and we're live <laughs> and it is uh game changers with me vicky abelson and my guest today is greg malavy greg malavy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've always doubled my name yeah after mary hartman you know, oh see i told you it was gonna double here we go Malavie, let, me, Greg let me stop that. all right so now we had four greg malavies <laughs> You know, Greg, I have to tell you, I, yeah. I know that a lot of people probably tell you this, and I've had interviewed many, many guests, but this is the truth. There was not a day that of five days a week for all that time that I did not spend with you and then spend the next day talking about <laughs> the whole day long. <laughs> I am so happy to meet you and to um, get to tell you that in, in person, kind of. <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, having a fan like you, my God, you were. How I mean, many episodes did you watch? Okay, three hundred and twenty-five episodes. Never missed one. One hundred and thirty wow. episodes of Forever Fernwood did not miss one, and then they repeated them a couple years later. Yeah. Watched them all again. It, it for me the funniest show that has ever been on television and you're obviously a woman of great taste and, <laughs> <I know. laughs> and you know before we talk about anything else i want you to tell us like how that happened for you because norman was in the living room and he told us the story from his perspective but how did it happen for you so it wasn't your first show you were on Bananza no no and no i've done a lot of television before that and a lot of films and uh and tons of theater and right. so when I got the audition, first of all, I read the script. I said, what the hell is this? This is weird. I don't know if I want to do this. And so I blocked, I blocked it first. Yeah. Said, oh, well, you know, it, it could be OK. Yeah. So I go in and I audition. And Joan Darling was the director. Right. And, and Louise was in the meeting, as was Norman. Uh -huh. And there was a table, big, big, like meeting room, conference yeah. room. Yeah. And, and the, there was a bedroom scene. So I said, OK. And I got up on the table as if I were, and I got a script in my hand, as if yeah. I was in bed. And Louise did too. And we did this audition on the table. Wow. And, and it worked. And it worked. And so the chemistry happened. We had chemistry right away. And Joan liked what we did. So did Norman. And I went home. I think maybe I got a chance at this thing. Maybe it's going to be OK. I met Norman Lear, and he's an impressive guy. And I liked uh -huh. him a lot. Joan, I loved. Joan Darling, I love Joan Darling. He was a great director, really great, brilliant. And Louise was great. And we just hit it off. And I got the part. Okay, so I'm all right, we'll come back to Mary Hartman because I want to go back because I you've been acting for a long time. I know your dad was a professional baseball player. Sorry, my daughter will get that. What? Uh, so I know your dad was a professional baseball player. Yes, on the right. Red Sox, and then, yeah, for a Yankee fan, not a good thing. But um, <laughs> so when you're a little kid, your father's a professional baseball player. Exactly. Yes, he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was playing for Buffalo in the old International League when I when I was born in Buffalo, no less. Through no fault of my own, I might add. <laughs> I would have preferred Manhattan or even the Bronx. <laughs> you're from. <laughs> but anyway, so I was born in Buffalo. And my dad was playing for the Buffalo Bisons. He had played for the, the White Sox originally and then the Red Sox. And then he hurt his arm and he couldn't throw as well. So he started playing second base. He was a shortstop. And he played for Casey Stengel in, um, uh, what the hell was Toledo for the Toledo Mud Hens. It was sold for like $55,000 to the, to the White Sox. He was really a good player, my father. Wow. Lifetime batting average over 300. But he, he, had, he couldn't throw. He used what, to call what, him years, rubber what years was he a professional? What years? Oh, was in, he? The 30s, in the thirties, in the thirties and forties. Wow. Thirties and forties, mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. And so, uh, I fell in love with baseball as a kid, and I was, I played in high school and college. I was captain of my college team, and then I, I was in the army. I got drafted, and I hurt myself uh, uh, running to first base to argue with an umpire. It was a championship game. And, in the European Championship, and our general was a big jock, and that's another story I'll tell you about later. But, but as far as my father is concerned, so he played for Buffalo. Uh -huh. and I, I've digressed off into me, which is really uh, ego maniacal. <laughs> Nonetheless, sorry about that. And so my dad uh, managed after he after his playing days were over. He became a playing manager in Class D league in the old 
Pennsylvania, Ontario, New York League. And we wound up in Jamestown, New York, where he was the manager. And that's kind of where I grew up. That's Lucille Ball's hometown. Wow. Yes. So I, I went to the summers in the Catskill Mountains. Wasn't Jamestown around? Was, no, no, Jamestown's not around, around the Catskills. No, the Jamestown is far west, southwestern New York. It's near, it's south of Buffalo, about 60 miles south. It's on Chautauqua Lake. They have a great summer resort there called Chautauqua, where people have residences there and they come about 10, 12,000, 15,000 people to assemble there in the summertime for concerts from the New York Philharmonic. They come there, I used to come there. And uh, Chautauqua was started in the 19th century. It was an institution where people did lectures. It was intellectual, intellectual stuff and also music. Wow. They have a big amphitheater where the Philharmonic plays and they play classical music. Yeah. And it's a very intellectual kind of wonderful place to go and relax for the summer. And people do. They live there the whole summer, many people do. And, and the whole Chautauqua Chicago Lake increases about 200,000 people in the summer because it's a beautiful lake. 22 mile I've long lake. Hmm? I've never been there. I've been never heard of Chautauqua. I've look up, look up the word Chautauqua is an Indian name. It means that's this resort where people used to go and do what they call the Chautauqua circuit lecture circuits. That's what it first started doing. I was in the low class Borscht Belt where it was just, you know, it was so, just. So, yeah, well, well, yeah, there you go. There was nothing yeah. smart going there, there, there on. Were, there. there were no comics there. No smart people. <laughs> yeah, right. Only smart people. Yeah. I used to go there all the time. Did you? Anyway, my dad so started coaching there and managing there. He's a player manager. At first, they won in 1941, 1942. They won. They won the Old Pony League, and then, um, and then, he managed in Buffalo. He started managing in, in minor leagues in Greenville, South Carolina and other areas, Fort Worth, Texas, Mobile, Alabama. And then he went to Montreal, uh -huh. managed Montreal. And, and he had Clo Koufax and Drysdale there with him. Wow. You know, do great Dodgers wow. here in LA and also in New York. And then they, they were ahead by like 12 games when he had Montreal in the old International League. And they brought up Koufax and Drysdale and they, they put him in second place. <laughs> And did go to the international uh, leagues, uh, world, uh, you know, big series for the championship. Wow. So anyway, wow. my dad went up to Brooklyn, and then they moved to LA, and therefore so did I. Oh. So how old were you when you moved to LA? Well, I, was, I was already out of school. You were. I was already out of the army when I came to LA. I, and, and so I had been to college. I have a degree in philosophy. I majored yeah. in philosophy. I went to Hobart College in upstate New York. I didn't major in theater. I really wasn't interested in theater until I got in the army. Okay, I started so wait, playing baseball. You think you were going to be a baseball player when you were young? I thought I might be. Yeah, I thought I might be. But I also was interested in teaching philosophy. I thought maybe becoming a priest. What? But I, was I know a what a woman is. Not Catholic. a womanizer, but I know you like the ladies. So that's for me to believe. I know, I know. So once I realized, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Time out, time out, time out. So no, <laughs> no, 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 celibacy didn't appeal to me at all. Yeah, no. So <laughs> that didn't work out. So, <laughs> yeah. so anyway, after the army, I, I went to New York and I, in the army, that's what turned me. I started going to the theater when I was at Fort Monmouth, stationed at Fort Monmouth. Went to the theater every weekend to see theater. I just fell in love with it in New York and decided I remember I'll do this early. if I don't if I don't become a, a professional baseball player, I'll do this. And when I hurt my knee, I couldn't run fast anymore. And they sent me back to Fort Mont on Fort Dix and they butchered my knee and I couldn't couldn't run fast anymore. Oh. So part that was part of my game because I'm a pretty good hitter, but not not a home run hitter. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I knew that I, my speed would help me. Uh, and that was gone. So I said, okay, I think I'll act. Just so, like that, you had no, you had no, were you in school plays? No, you were, I, no, I never did a school play. Never did a school no. play? No, I did review work. I sang and danced and did stuff like that in college, but it was fun, you know, and uh, I did that for fun. I never thought that's what I wanted to do. And I used to do and accents no, with friends. No training? Oh, no, no. I went to school for two years. Uh, both yeah, I studied with privately in New York. 
with Strasbourg and then Strasbourg again in LA. And then I started, went to the, into a, a theater school for two years and, and then continued to study forever with Eric Morris here in LA. I stayed with Eric. I stayed with Strasbourg, as I say, and with other people, Corey Allen also taught. Um, and I studied with Eric Morris for seven years and change. And Charles Conrad from the Neighborhood Playhouse. Wow. Was another one. Peter Miller, who's in Blackboard Jungle. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of my teachers and studied with people from Moscow Art Theater and Michael Chekhov's people. So I've done a lot of training and I still study with Alan Feinstein here in, in LA when I come to LA. I and you also teach. And like I, now, teach. I, I heard something. Did you, were you in class? Did you have an acting class with like Nicholson and Hopper? Am I making this up? I was in it, in one with Jack and, and, and yeah. other people like Pat Harrington and, and uh, who else? Uh, your Linda Cristal was in the class. Judy Spicer says hello. Uh, we we are talking about baseball, Judy. We've already spoken about it. Judy told <laughs> she's a great friend. Judy Spicer is a great friend. She was a great friend of Meredith's, my 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 wife's. Yes. This is another story, indeed. You know, Meredith. I met Meredith McRae in Charles Conrad's class in an acting class. Wow. Charles Conrad had had, had taught at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York. Meisner's place, Sanford mm -hmm. Meisner. And I was already, had already studied with Meisner's people. Um, so I wanted to go to the neighborhood playhouse in New York when I got out of the army, but I didn't have the money. So, and I didn't want to borrow any money from my father. Uh, and I thought, well, I should pay, but I didn't. And then I came to, New I came to LA. So how did you get started? How, how did your career start? You started in theater, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. In New York. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and then so did you well, make then I came to LA. I came to LA when my father came to LA. I came to LA. And then I started I studied in LA at the old place called Theater of Arts. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Peter Miller. Charles mm -hmm. Conrad I heard about because 20th used him as a uh, as a uh, teacher of a lot of the um, uh, starlets. And so what <laughs> Rod Steiger said, one of the reasons I want to go to acting class, there are women there. So, <laughs> pretty women. No so, women in baseball. No. No, there are not no, not many. They're gonna have women umpires maybe soon, but but yeah. not so far, no. Um, nonetheless, uh, that that idea of doing having a baseball career is over. And the Giants were interested in me when I was playing. Wow. And, uh, and my dad said my scouting report on me was I had an outside chance to make the major leagues. And in those days, people didn't make money, a lot of money like they make now. Right. If I was in my prime as, as a young man and, and the money was like it is now, uh -huh. I would have worked like hell to try to be, become a professional player. I think but you I didn't become an that. actor for the money. I, I can't believe No, I, oh. I never became an actor because I thought I was going to get rich and famous. You know, I, I did it because I loved the work. I love it. I love to do theater. It's number one for me. I've done over a hundred plays in my life. It's and I, the last thing I did, well, not the last thing I've done, but the last thing on stage I did was in 2019, it's at Seattle Rep, which is a great, great repertory. I mean, I'm not a repertory company. It's not really a repertory company anymore. They call it Seattle Rep, but <clears throat> it's a beautiful physical place. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Seattle's a great town, yes. but I did a play there and I played a guy who uh, gets to be a hundred in the play. Wow. <laughs> Most interesting. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, and, and you also did a play not long ago with Marlo Thomas. Yes, yes I did. Clever Little Lies, a really good play, fun play, a great role opposite Marlo playing her husband. And uh, she is great. I love Marlo Thomas. Great, great woman, wonderful actor, and a generous, wonderful heart. Uh, Lovely. And Phil Donahue, her husband, is a, a terrific guy. Uh, they have a wonderful place. A, penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue. And she's very generous with her time and, and circumstance. And so uh, spent a lot of time there. Oh, how long. Hanging out with her. <clears throat> and we did the play and on, uh, I forget where the hell we did it, on the island. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember the damn, 
I can't remember the name of the town, but anyway, we did it on the island. They got a boat. We spent time on the boat with them. It was great fun. The cast loved, everybody loved her. So yeah, she was great. She was great. I'm a fan from that girl from way back, but it's, I haven't seen Marlo act in a long time, but it's she's a good actor. It's wonderful to know that. I think maybe that's the last thing she did. That was what, five years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's terrific. And so for, okay, so for you, have you ever had to have a job job, Greg? Did you ever have to like? Well, when I was looking for work, when I first came to LA, yeah, I worked at, uh, I was a timekeeper. I worked at, May, at, the May, at, at the May Company. And the May Company was on Wilshire Boulevard in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. I worked there in, because the Theater of Arts is right across the street and I was a stage manager there. And I, I lived in that theater for a while. Wow. And worked at the, at the May Company. Because <clears throat> I didn't want to live in my parents' place. My father, my father and mother had moved to LA and they had an apartment in Baldwin Hills at the time. Uh -huh. Dodger Stadium was, was at the Coliseum in, that, in those days, 58, 59. Mm -hmm. so. so, how did you start making money as an actor? What was your first, how did you first start? The Verdict is Yours was my first TV show with Telly Savalas. Wow. It was like an improvisational thing. Really? Yeah, I was pretty good at improv. Yeah, it was. And the verdict is yours, meaning the audience could decide whether you're guilty or, or not guilty. <laughs> Telly was guilty, period. <laughs> <laughs> he looked guilty. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that was the first job I had in television, yeah. Back in the day, I forget. It was 1961, I think. Wow. Dear God. And, so, and you did tons of things. You did Bonanza. You did... Yep. You did tons of, of television. Hundreds so of television shows. So was that something that parlayed? It's like once you got in, did you were you able to just go from well, one job? Well, you know, I tell my st young students, if you're good, if you're really good, really good, and you work hard, and you're going to work. Eventually, it'll work if you're good. You think? I can't tell, tell you when it will happen or how much you'll work, but you will work. Uh, I just had a student of mine that was you know, problematic as, as an actor. Mm -hmm. she, she couldn't find work in New York. She came to here, came to um, LA, uh -huh. and she just got a, a film with Denzel, she's got a, a nice little role opposite Denzel Washington. Wow. <laughs> Do you really believe that, that everybody who works hard gets work? You will, you will do something. I, I do believe that, that wow. everybody that's good will get work. Doesn't mean they'll make a living necessarily. Yeah. They'll get work. And if I can make a living, then others can too. I believe that. I've, I've made a living, that's all I've ever done since I started. Fantastic. You know, doesn't mean I got a job right away, but I mean, it took didn't take all that long, a couple of years before I, um, but I worked hard. You know, I, I wanted to be good. I mean, the fact that you still study, I did scene after that, scene after scene. Hmm? The fact that you still study. And I still study. That's and I still everything. take a class. Mm -hmm. And so, because <clears throat> I love the work. I love the work. How did you I had an audition Monday, this past Monday for a Bosch. <clears throat> and I worked on that thing. I, mem I memorized the lines. You got to memorize the lines now. That? Huh? Do you have a trick for that, for memorizing? No. No trick. Repetition, repetition, repetition. <laughs> over and over and over and over and over and over and over until it becomes a prayer. Mm. And then you don't think about the lines. All you think about is your impulse and what you want. I love that. What are you doing? That's Meisner's doing. Mm. And then, you know, you also have to know how you feel about everything. Your feelings have to be accessible as actors. I'm working with a young 14-year-old girl right now. She's very, unfortunately, she's done too much amateur work, too much theater work where she's told what to do and how to say it. Oh. And so she's got to unlearn that in order to be more impulsive and more spontaneous and more available emotionally. Uh -huh. Because her emotional life right now is, is somewhat, it's indicated. And so she doesn't feel as much as she could. You know, and we're working on Zoom, so I'm able to, it's like film. But film and theater are not that different in terms of impulse, et cetera. I know people think that it's so, it's so only in terms of volume, if you're not mic'd anymore. Mm -hmm. You're mic'd now on Broadway, you know? Right. I mean, I, the play, uh, 
Marlo and I did not that long ago. We were mic'd. Mm -hmm. The play I just did at Seattle Rep, we were not mic'd. But the acoustics are so good there. You don't need to be mic'd. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you- There is more you have to do with, isn't there more you have to do with your face if you're on stage than if you're on film and the camera's right? No, 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 absolutely not. No. Because it's all about being real, I guess, no matter what medium you're on, right? Right. Mandy Patangum came to see me in a play at Seattle because his wife was in the play. Mm -hmm. And his son also saw the play. And I had a, a, a very good role, but playing this old man, I listened a lot. Mm -hmm. So I actively listen. I don't just pretend to listen. I actively listen to what they're saying, actively listen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do anything, but people watched me. I was told, Mandy said that, we're drawn to watch you. Wow. I said, well, I'm not pulling focus. I don't want that. I don't want that, but I'm engaged. Right. And if you're really genuinely engaged, audiences know it. Because human beings know what human beings are up to authentically when they're authentic. And mm -hmm. it, it registers with people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so his wife wasn't terribly that pleased to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's true. So in that sense, it's not all that different. Maybe volume-wise it might be. If you're not, not Mike, they might ask for more voice. Like right. I played at the Guthrie mm -hmm. in, in Minneapolis, which is the United States' first regional right. theater. Right. I, by Sir Tyrone, Tyrone Guthrie, founded that theater. And at that time, the acoustics weren't all that good there. That was in, in 1997, 98. And, uh, but now they have a new theater, so it's much better. But then we were told they had people scouts like out, way out all over the theater to see if we could be heard. So we had to do voice much louder than normal, of right. course. But, but no, generally speaking now in theater, especially when you're mic'd, you do it as if you're doing film. I love that. And, and there's no, not that big a difference, perhaps volume wise, that's about it. But if you're, if you're truthful on stage and on film, you're gonna get work. You're gonna be interesting and watched. So Greg, you were telling me a story before we came on the air that I want you to tell about when you were doing Bob yeah. Carroll, Ted and Alice with- Oh, Bobby Carroll, Ted and Alice. Yeah, were, one of the uh, first few films I've done. <clears throat> well, Paul Mazursky was the director Ugh. and we rehearsed that uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, that film. And then for research, I went up to, I was with Meredith McRae at the time, my wife, my to-be wife. We weren't married yet. But we got in a little plane and went up to Esalen. Um, in Big Sur? In Big Sur, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we flew somewhere near there. I can't remember where we landed initially, but we flew near there. And then we were bused up to Esalen. And we got arrived, arrived there about between 10 and 11 at night. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer Jones was on the plane. Mm -hmm. And I had fallen fall in love with her when she does this song of Bernadette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a miracle work in this chaste little peasant girl who became, uh, had visions of the Virgin Mary and then became this icon of chastity and virtue. And she goes out of the plane and she did a little drawing on the plane on a napkin. And I, I still have it Aww. somewhere in my, in my vault somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we did when we arrived at Esalen was you undress and get into a nude bath. This was for a weekend. I'm doing research for Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, right? Right. At Esalen, because this is where a lot of the film takes place. And right. I played the group leader there. Mm -hmm. And I was a psychologist and, and led the group. And so I'm doing this research. And one of the research things is we're in the nude baths. And so into the nude baths, Meredith and I went. And Jennifer Jones came much a little bit later, like about seven to 10 minutes after we had all gathered about 12 people in this big hot pool, hot tub. And so she came and found key light in the moonlight and undressed. And she was very, very attractive at this time. Mm -hmm. And as she got into the nude bat, I kind of slipped over and she sat on top of me and Meredith punched me. <laughs> And I said, oh, excuse me, this is all planned, by the way, my devious <laughs> line. 
Jennifer Jones naked sat on me, this chaste, virtuous woman who I wow. touched was great in song of bird. <laughs> anyway, so that was my the event of the of the day. And that's the research I did for Bob and Carolyn Telenos. And then we also spent time with a guy named we did we did uh, <clears throat> kind of a group thing with a guy named George Bach, who was a very interesting man. He did tra fight training, how to fight fairly. And so we did that. Oh, I, we did that on the on a Playboy after dark thing. Okay, I I was tell I watched that. <clears throat> you were the one who told me about it. Yeah. Wow. I yes, mean, we did. You guys were uh, you <clears throat> had kind of a fair fight on the air. Yes, we did. Yeah, we had a fair fight <laughs> on the air, and that of course people when I mean, we tried to do it in life, and all that went out the window when you get angry. It goes out the window. What do you mean I said that? What? No. I'm mean, not supposed to yell. Oh, I am yelling anyway, because I'm pissed. So, so, so was uh, your character in Bob Carroll Ted now is based on that guy? On George Bach? Yeah. No, no, no. no. Oh. It was based on my sense of being a group leader uh, as a psychologist and my sense of being a, maybe a physician or a psychiatrist. But no, no, it was based on my own idea of what a group therapist would do. And so... So yeah. was that, was that... it's imagination, you know. That's the key thing that actors have and, and must have. It's imagination, you know. So I imagine myself, like Ian McKellen says, of course, that I imagined, you see, that I'm a psychologist, that I'm going to do these people and play the leader. <laughs> so that's all I'm gonna pretend. <laughs> so pretending is good, you know. Pretending. That's it. So you pretend, you know, you imagine that you're this person and, and lo and behold, all those ideas you have, you allow to be there for you and your intuition will help, you know? I call it the magical eyes, impulse, intuition, intellect, and uh, speaking well <laughs> at times. That helps, that yeah. helps. So, okay, so going, so you're getting this TV work, you're making a living now as an actor. Mm -hmm. You get married. I Bob. did commercials too, by the way. You did commercials. I had a friend of mine tell me, oh, you're not right for commercials. And go and behold, the very first audition I had of a commercial for um, State Farm. Yeah. I got it. I got it. They pay well, don't they? And they paid well in those days because you got residuals like crazy, you know, because they ran it a lot, you know, for, for a year or more. You know, State Farm is there. They still use that theme song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so then you get Mary Hartman, and I would imagine that that was not only a career changer, but kind of a life changer. In many ways, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. So you guys... 1974, we did the pilot, yeah. Oh, 74, really? I didn't yes. know that early. I know. So what, what kept it... Well, it, so it was a CBS project at first. And they uh -huh. aired it once, I think, one or two weeks, uh, twice a week, and it didn't work. It didn't work. So they they wanted they canceled it. They wanted to cancel it. So Norman said, "I like this show so much, I'm going to syndicate it." And that's what he did. He sent out people all over the country through Metro Media, more or less. Mm -hmm. It was on Channel Eleven here in LA, mm -hmm. and he sold it to enough to make it viable economically. For everybody involved and for him and that's what we did and we did 325 of them that way because like in seattle it was on at four o'clock in the afternoon wow it was on so, at different times throughout the country yeah it was on at 10 o'clock in tucson so so did you guys know when you started doing it did you have any idea of the cult class no, no 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 we still have people who are huge fans that, that still buy it. You can buy it on, buy all 325 episodes uh, on DVD. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's available anywhere else. It's, oh, it's, it's, I get residual checks from Europe a lot. So it's filmed, it's shown in Europe and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and all throughout the English speaking world, which is mostly Europe. It Scandinavian has, countries, especially. Really? It yeah. had to be a huge challenge. I mean, that was a lot of dialogue. You were doing five shows a week. Five shows a week, yeah. And so how many were you, how were you film? How could you possibly film that much? Well, we learned to do it fast. Um, over time. 
And initially it was really difficult because they'd never done it before. Never, Norman had never done that before. Right. And uh, Joan Darling had never filmed that way before, one, a show a day. She'd done Mary Tyler Moore. She won an Emmy for an episode of that. Chuckles but she'd crap. never done to do it quickly. And we finally got a guy named Jim Drake who was able to be, <clears throat> to get to hurry up the process. And then we got very good at that. And memorization, it's not all that difficult. You just got to work hard at it. That's all. You got to be very focused and, and not mess around with it. And was everybody able to do, was everybody able to do that? Did, were there some actors who struggled with it? Yes, Louise, Louise had trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, she had, would write stuff on the kitchen table. I was going to ask. hand, <laughs> on my forehead. <laughs> A little bit here and there, here and there. Mm -hmm. And um and some people did have difficulty, but but mostly not. Oh, and did you guys have I'm fun? Not. I mean, I mean. Oh God, yes. Think oh. Of the people that were oh. on that show. Oh, Jack fun. AK Place, Graham Jarvis. I mean, just Dodie Goodman. What a cast! What a yeah. cast! And Dabney Coleman was funny and oh, fun. God. And so many people were. We just had a joyous time. I remember one time, uh, Mary Kay Place was. I forget what she was talking about death or something, I can't remember what the hell it was. But we fell, we, we fell out so much that we just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and it took forever to get this shot because it was so much fun. We had so much fun doing the show. Just so much fun. And, and so when you have joyous work like that, life is so good and so wonderful, you know? And that's what I love about acting. It's just a joyous thing. I find it a great joy in doing this work and still love it and still want to do more of it. As I said, I had an audition on, on Monday, loved just that whole process. You know, it's a pain in the butt to do eco casts mm. as they do now, because there's no, no audience, there's nobody there, but a camera and somebody doing it and saying the lines off camera to you while you audition. But uh, it's so impersonal now, it's, a, mm. it's disconcerting, but nonetheless, the work and the process of getting there is so much fun. I hope I get this part. I hope but you do. It's an ex Navy vet. It's a gardener now here in LA somewhere. It's a Bosch. You said it's a Bosch. Spin off, uh, of, Bosch. Um, a spin -off of Bosch, they call it. So, do you know who, who the character is? It's not Bosch anymore, right? Well, they say it's Bosch, but I don't know who the hell it is. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It's, a, it's the title of spin off. So, we'll see when that's going to happen. Get it to, I hope. Me too. too. So, Me too. so. Greg, what were you doing when the whole COVID thing started? Were you in New York when that all started? Yes. And were you in the middle of something? Were you, did you get sidelined? What, what was going on in your life when it started? Well, when it started, you know, people got scared. Mm -hmm. And all the theater companies shut down. Theater shut down. Yes. And so one was pretty much compromised. No career at the moment. Like, what the hell are we going to do? And so we can't find work. There's no work. Right. And theater and, and the television film is shut down, too, because they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So stayed home a lot. Got masks. Bought the wrong masks. Did that. The one with ventilators. Bought a bunch of those. Spent a whole bunch of money. I wish I had back. And, and I, wanted, I wanted the best ones. They were like $250, some of them. Yeah. With ventilator things in that thing all over your face. Oh my God. I thought, well, how do you do this? What happens? Wait a minute. As I breathe out, wait a minute. If I have a virus breathing out, somebody's going to get it. So they, then you went to a hospital. If you had to go to a hospital, you had to get rid of that mask. They gave you a, a surgical oh, mask. Yeah, right. And then what happened in March of 2020, my, my life partner, <clears throat> uh, Ariana Johns, I'm with a woman for the last, you know, 20 years. Um, she got it. Oh, no. Well, she has asthma, for one thing. <clears throat> and there are allergies. And so she, she got it. And I'm a health nut, so I don't drink, I don't smoke. I, I um, take lots of, lots of supplements and I eat pretty much almost all plant-based, pretty much. I'm not a vegan, but close. Uh-huh. Escatorian at times. Yes. And so... How did she? How did I, she? How did I, she get it? Do you think? 
How does he get it? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Were you, were you guys out in the world? No, no. We were wearing masks. We were not out that much. We did go to get groceries and things like that. And she did that. But she's also compromised. She has asthma badly mm -hmm. and breathing problems when that happens. Mm -hmm. And so, and she has also other compromised things. She's allergic to nuts. Uh, peanuts she can tolerate. Peanuts are fine, but like almonds will kill her. Wow. She almost died when she was a kid because he, somebody gave her an almond. She ate it and she wound up in the hospital and wow. almost died. Wow. How bad was her COVID? Very bad. So bad that she felt that she couldn't, we had to go to a hospital. But we found out that the hospital was so full at that time in March of 2020, you couldn't right. find a bed. And people were dying on gurneys in the hallways. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, so we decided to try to tough it out. And she made the good move of calling a doctor and this one doctor advisor, a woman doctor advisor to get a, it's not a respirator, but a, a breathing machine. Like you put in a, a drop of, of liquid into this little device, I forget what they call them. Um, it's like an inhalator, but it's not an inhalator, but it's like that. And- A vapor, not a machine, vaporizer. It's like a vaporizer, but it's not a vaporizer, but it's like one, but it's a machine that, that puts it into, your, into a tube, into a, and they put it over your mouth, uh -huh. and your nose, and you breathe. You breathe in. You breathe in whatever medication they give you. So she wasn't in the hospital. She was doing this at home. She did this at home, and it worked. Wow. Her fever went down. She had a 104 temperature. Wow. Fever went down. I didn't get sick at all. I was just going to say, you didn't get sick? But I take, I take a protocol. I do a protocol of vitamin C, get a bit of glucans, a uh, whole bunch of protocols I do to bolster the immune system. What else? Do I you think that's why. And also type A blood. It's also, type a also. Be... we're more likely to get it, type A. That's what they said. We're the no. most likely. Yeah. Type A, most no, likely. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not type A. I'm type type O. Not mm. type A. I'm type O. Type oh, o. it's the least likely. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. That's I got my blood, my blood mixed up. So, so what, <laughs> my what letters mixed up. Tell what? us what supplements you take. We want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Were you taking a lot of zinc? Yes. Mm -hmm. I take zinc. I'm not taking it right now because I'm at my daughter's. I have my stash of vitamins and supplements at home, but mm -hmm. I should get some zinc. I went to the vitamin shop yesterday and bought some stuff. I take mushrooms. Which mushrooms do you? I do too. Well, Which there's one? seven or 11 of them that I take different and a capsule. Uh huh. I eat mushrooms a lot, like baby bellas or matakis or whatever the hell they, whatever they got, reishi. Whatever mushrooms I can, I might, might eat them three to four times a week, if not more. And I take them every day in capsule form. Mm -hmm. They're great, great for um, the immune system. Oregano. Oregano. Uh -huh. oregano. Oregano oil, especially, is very good for that if, you, if you're compromised. Mm -hmm. I don't take oregano oil every day, mm -hmm. but I do oregano every day on my oatmeal. Oregano? I do, I do quinoa and oatmeal organic oatmeal from Trader Joe's Yeah, almost every day. And when I put in it, I use blueberries every day, mm -hmm. organic blueberries, organic strawberries in, in the oatmeal and uh, uh, organic banana I use too and organic raisins in it and also soy milk. I'm a believer in soy. There are others that think soy is bad for you. I am not one of them. I'm a, I'm a fan of Dr. Michael Greger, G-R-E-G-E-R, -E -E he's a vegan. Mm -hmm. He's an MD, mm -hmm. and he thinks soy milk is okay, organic, of course. Mm -hmm. And I do that. And um, you put oregano oil in your oatmeal? no, not oregano oil. No, 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 no. I put oregano, organic oregano from Trader Joe's, on my uh, on my oatmeal. I can't imagine. They're called that. adaptogens. There's it's, it's spices. Turmeric I take every day. So do I. Every day mm -hmm. with bioprene, mm -hmm. red, uh, uh, black pepper. Mm -hmm. And I use the mill that I get from Trader Joe's. You know? That's <clears throat> so I take that every day. Turmeric on my oatmeal. On my oatmeal. Cinnamon I take every day. Mm -hmm. Organic cinnamon, organic cinnamon from Ceylon. C-E-Y-L-O-N is the best cinnamon, the most nutrition, the most bang for your buck. You can buy it for $14.95, you can buy a pound of it on, on Amazon. Organic. 
Wow. You just, otherwise, you go to the, you know, Whole Foods, Bezos, other, other, <laughs> other, um, what shall I say, hobby. <laughs> we're all we're all making sure he can go. He can go to Mars. <laughs> yeah. Spend his yeah. tax dollars. Spend the tax dollars he saves. He can spend on making a place for himself at Mars. <laughs> anyway. He doesn't pay any taxes. It really pisses me off too. We can talk about that. <clears throat> Corporations, not so too many too, but that's another story. Anyway, I do that it's, and I, it's I take good care of myself and I, therefore I'm, my immune system is very strong. It's a miraculous that you lived together and did not get the COVID. You didn't get it. And her parents got it. I didn't get it from them either. Wow. This is lately in the last few months they got it. Oh, About the last four months ago. After hmm? being vaccinated? No, they weren't vaccinated at the time. Not yet. No, after they got it, they were they got vaccinated. Yes, and I'm vaccinated. That's another story I'll I'll, I'll share with your your audience too. I did a lot of research on the with the anti-vaxxers. I kind of was in that camp for a little while. Really? Until I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe maybe I want to be a part of the grand experiment. Maybe I want to do that. I listened. I I listened to. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, or A. Kennedy, F. Kennedy, whatever he is, what little initial he has, I forget, who's a, a very passionate anti-vaxxer. But he's smart, and a lot of smart people are in that camp. However, they're misled, I think, misinformed, and or they make, they make judgments that haven't been validated yet, and they, they leap to conclusions way too fast. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to leave that camp and become pro-vax. And so I've, I've had my two Pfizer shots, and now I'm very, very pro-vax. Were you anti-vax? Uh, I, I was an anti-vax. I was never an anti-vax. I was a wait-and-see guy. Was it a health for health reasons? I'm sure it wasn't for political reasons. No, it wasn't political at all. No, 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 no. No, it was for health. I thought, wait a minute. This is new. I'm not sure what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the side effects may be. Mm -hmm. It's never been done before. Mm -hmm. It's not a normal vac vaccine. In the sense that it's a, a rather weak virus, a weak part of the they made it weak. They made it much weaker. You get a little bit, and it simulates the immune system. This is new. It teaches the the body to recognize the virus and then to attack it. Hmm? It's a genetic thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I was I was wary of that. But then I thought, wait a minute. Then I've, I I listened to one woman. A black woman, by the way, who've done great research on this thing and been working on it for 11 years. They've been working on this for a long time, mm -hmm. genetic modality for vaccines. Mm -hmm. So wait a minute. They know, I think maybe they know what they're doing. They've been working on this a long time. Mm -hmm. So they're way ahead of it. And that's why they could get it done so fast mm -hmm. and make it real. And so I listened to her and that be, that's the thing that pushed me over into the edge of so wait and see to become a pro-vax. I listened to the anti-vaxxers, but they, I didn't buy their logic because they jumped, they jumped in logic. And I majored in philosophy, so I know that how, how certain people make assumptions that are perhaps wrong. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, that's the case. Mm -hmm. and even the guy who was head of Baylor School of Medicine, uh, McCulloch, I think his name is, Peter McCulloch, mm -hmm. who's a, an MD, and he's an anti-vaxxer now, but he makes he makes he makes conclusions that are wrong to to say that it's conspiracy. And once they get into the conspiratorial stuff, I say, wait a minute, time out. Not so. Mm -hmm. Then you're into QAnon ter territory, and many 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 of them are, mm -hmm. and that's scary because then it's politicized. Mm -hmm. And then I find out they're Trump supporters. <laughs> that's, that's what does it for me. <laughs> you know. You know so do you get to uh, vote in the recall election? We were starting to talk about this. Yes, I'm pro-Governor Newsom. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say no, mm -hmm. no, no. Good. Even though I live in New York, I still vote in California. So far, they haven't caught me. and Because I'm very into California politics. I lived here for 50 years. So what do you so, think about Cuomo? What do you think about that whole thing? It's scary. He doesn't, he didn't get it. He didn't get the Me Too movement. He didn't get it. You can't do what you used to be able to do. You can't do it. You can kid around a little bit, but you got to be very careful. You can't. You can't do it. And he didn't get that. And his his 
his hubris has been his arrogance mm -hmm. because he's above it. I'm the governor. You know, come on. Mm -hmm. I can kid around with you. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. And then it may impinge over into the area of, you know, flirtation, uh, I, uh, a probe of a kind to see whether you may be available. Maybe, you know, I, I'm into dating younger women. You know, it may be joking. You know, I tell I've, I've told younger women, even in my class, if I, if, I were, if I were two weeks younger, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> but you can't do that anymore. You know? <laughs> no, you can't do it anymore. No, you can't do that anymore. And so you got to know what game is being played, what's being played, and, and what, what the rules are now. And they're different. Old school doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back to your partner, does she have any long hauler symptoms? How is she doing now? She does have a few. She really? she's in a group that, of long haulers. I know a couple, I know two other people are long haulers, friends of mine. Scary. A woman who is a regular on this show um, just had a pacemaker put in and is having continued heart issues. She got COVID at the beginning, going for an MRI. Everyone who was getting an MRI from the workers there, they all got COVID. And she yeah, you've got it. So my, my philosophy right now is, look, I'm going to do everything I can to not get this. I'm vaccinated. I have the Pfizer two shots through UCLA Health. When I was here in February, I got it. Mm -hmm. As I come here to see my daughter now, about six months out of the year now, I'm, I'm in LA. Not quite six months, but close. <clears throat> so, because I'm, I'm looking for work here too. And so what, what, what are her long hauler symptoms? What, how did that manifest for her? Breathing, because she's, a, she's an asthmatic. So she has breathing problems at times and shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know of someone who got Got a breakthrough after being vaccinated twice, 36 years old. Yikes. 15 trips to the ICU and he's on line for a lung transplant. From oh my God. Oh yeah. my God. It's not, it's this is serious shit. It's serious stuff. Serious stuff. And uh, people still who don't get it, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And some of them get it, like the governor of, of, of Texas. Oh. He tested yeah. positive. Yes, what, yes. today, yesterday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whether he, he's got the best of care, he's got he's already on whatever the hell antidote there's are there there are. I forget what it's called. There's a an infusion that they're doing. Yeah. Malacon. Malacon and something like that. Malacon, something like that. That they can do. But that's available to very few people. It's what they gave Trump, Trump. had it. Right. And and this other Republican gets it too. <laughs> so so anyway we could talk about that so okay so let's go back to happier days so how did you how did you meet meredith how did that romance start oh i met meredith in charles conrad's acting class charles conrad has taught at the neighborhood place in new york when meisner was there and he's very meisnerian but he'd become more zen-like in his approach as time went by Mm -hmm. uh, especially for film. He was a favorite of 20th Century Fox. There were a lot of starlets in his class. One of the things that attracted me to the class in the first place. <laughs> so, what, you, what um, year did you start studying there, approximately? Somewhere in the 60s, I forget mm -hmm. when. But mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I met Meredith in, in 65, actually. I met, that's, where I met, that's when I met Meredith. I, I joined, I think, his class in 65. Yeah, I think so. And she came shortly thereafter. And uh, we did a scene together. And I asked her to do a scene, or she asked me to do a scene. She asked me to do a scene. I said, okay. And we did that. And we got to be friendly. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history, more or less. What a golden couple. There's a great yeah. photo that I- I called her my golden, the golden girl, what? She was the golden girl, gorgeous. gorgeous she was. Woman. And you were a beautiful couple. And <clears throat> a photo that I have on Facebook where you wear, you were so stylish. You were wearing this very high, almost Nehru coat with like brass buttons. I know, I know, I know. I don't know what the oh. hell it was. Wow. That was the Edwardian days of, of, of dress in, in the 60s, that Edwardian look that the Beatles brought right. to the United States. And that's what I had on that day, as I recall. Yeah, that, that picture, I look at that picture, oh my God, who the hell, what, that's me? With so this fabulous. gorgeous girl, oh my God. 
Yeah, the couple ideal. Mm -hmm. In France, we were called, we went to France, to Paris once, and somebody came up and called Le Couple Ideal. And, and so that was very nice if somebody flattered us like that. So the ideal couple. Oh, yeah. You guys were a golden couple. And you did a lot of TV together. You did a lot of stuff together. We did a lot of game shows together, yeah, a lot of a interviews cool. together, Mike Douglas, many other things, other, others too. And Carol so, Soskin yeah. is saying, how is your daughter? She knows Allison, I guess. She must know you, Carol Soskin. She wants to know how Allison is. She's fine. She was she was here a little while ago showing how to do Zoom, <laughs> or, or how to get it. And lo and behold, here we are. So here there. Are. And I, I can do Zoom, but her, her computer is slow and she, she knows how to work it. I'm, I'm not good at it. So, I'm digitally challenged. Yeah, well, you know, we need the kids. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I much love, I wish the hell I was better at it. So, so Greg, after Mary Hartman, I would assume during that whole period now, and Meredith's doing Petticoat, no, that was before. She was doing Petticoat Junction before in My Three Sons. That's before right. Mary Hartman. Right. Okay, so she's already like, a <clears throat> her fa your father-in-law, wow. My father-in-law, go ahead. Huge. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he was great. He was great. He had an alcohol problem, but other than that, he was great. Did you get, you had a good relationship with him? I did. We liked each other a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, got along very, very well. He called me Gregor. Nice. Uh, yeah, we got along great. And uh, he, was, he was a fun guy to be around, except when he drank too much, he was not fun. He got, he got nasty. He got angry. He got, had a dark side that way. Did you, so, did you never have an issue with drugs or alcohol? No, I never did a lot of drugs. I, I, I on occasion would drink too much, mm -hmm. but I haven't had a, I haven't had a drink in a long, long time because was, my doctor said, if you want to drink, you know, but you shouldn't because you're too old. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you're right. I don't feel well in the morning. If I have a, like a half a glass, uh, two glasses of wine, mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling good the next day. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm an actor. I want to feel good. So I stopped. About, I don't know when, 14 years ago, something like that. And so um, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I, you know, I, I don't do that because I wanna, I'm going to be right. I exercise not as much as I should. That's the one thing I don't do enough of because of the, the pandemic, the gyms were closed. Right. So I've really gone back to a gym. I do push ups. I'm not, I used to be able to do 100 push ups when I was doing Clever Little Lies. Wow. Like backstage, I do 100 push-ups before I went on stage sometimes, or 50. Wow. Usually, usually not that 100, but 50. Because it wore me up, because I was in very good shape then. But now I'm not doing them as much, and I'm, I'm still not back to a gym, because now with the Delta variant, I don't want to go back. So what, so how, what does your life look like now? It, you it looks very much like it did in 2020. Okay, I don't go out that much. How I do go to it? restaurants. I've been to restaurants without go, a mask. You go inside? I have been inside restaurants twice now. Okay. How was it? No, more than that. Three times, three times. How was flying? I haven't done that yet. No. I haven't learned to flap, flap, my, flap my arms. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to go there. It's a bad joke. Okay. Flying was fine. Uh, I, first time I flew out here was with Alaska Airlines. Uh -huh. Because at that time they were the ones, one of the ones that had no seats in between people, mm -hmm. in between people. Mm -hmm. So I flew out here in let's see, August of 2020. It was the first time I came back to LA, mm -hmm. um, and there was nobody on the plane hardly at all. There may be 50 people on the plane, if that, maybe 35 between mm -hmm. 35 and 50. Mm -hmm. So it was great, and it went back the same way. Nobody was on the plane. Alaska is not a popular airline. It's more popular right. with young people because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I took JetBlue out here, my plane was five hours late. <laughs> what? We got delayed in Newark. In Newark, we got delayed because of rain and thunder and lightning. So it took, I was on the plane 11 hours coming to LA. Ah. So I, I'm flying Alaska back to New York. How was, so did you feel safe when you were on the plane for 11 hours? Did you feel Yes, because I was masked. I was double masked 
in 2020, but only single mask this time. Mm -hmm. And yet people in the waiting room are not wearing masks. Most of them are not wearing masks. So that bothered the hell out of me. So I have a K95 I put on and maybe a surgical mask over that. I didn't do that. I just wore a surgical mask because I felt I'm pretty safe because I'm, I'm vaccinated. But that again is the myth. Yeah, I'm safe, probably mostly 90% safe, but there's that 10% window that maybe, maybe some idiot. The guy next to me, there was no, at JetBlue in New York, there was no, Newark, there was no place to sit. Couldn't sit and wait for the plane. What? No, there was no place to sit. People were sitting on the floor. I found one seat, somebody had abandoned it. There was, there was luggage next to me, but I sat in it anyway. And the young guy came back, said, oh, okay. And he sat on the floor, which is nice of him. Wow. But wow. there's that. So I, I wear my mask when I go out. You know, people don't, but they, I do now. And I wear it in LA all the time. Mm -hmm. How, so I, do plan to go to, I do plan to go to a restaurant. I want to sit outside. That's what I do. I sit yeah. 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 It's taking the mask off in with other people <laughs> with Delta variant is just too great. I know so many people that have gotten COVID that were double vaxxed and have gotten it in the last couple months. Yeah. 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 But your regimen sounds very healthy. I'm gonna, I'm looking back into the uh, the mushrooms now. Oh, mushrooms are very, very uh, supportive of the immune system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really eat them. Eat them as many as you can and as often as you can. So yeah. the, the, the supplement that you're taking, the pill, has a bunch of different mushrooms in it because I got a yes. powder from China before the pandemic started that I used to put in my coffee and mushroom <clears throat> powder. I have no idea what the hell that is, but I've never taken a pill, a supplement. Yeah, I get I get them at uh, the vitamin shop. Okay, I have to look into that. And you, you can buy them on on Amazon too if you want to. I mean, I think one of the vitamin sh stores that I not stores but places on on the internet that I use is Swanson's. Mm -hmm. They're inexpensive, but they're very, very third-party uh, certified, which I like. And so I buy those. But the protocol I use is this. Vitamin C is extremely important. Right. That's what I'm drinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like the liposomal form from Code Age. C-O-D-E-A-G-E -E is what I buy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's less expensive than others. It's still quite good. Third-party mm -hmm. certified. And it's more readily assimilated by the body. And I take them, I take like 3,000 a day, 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C, mm -hmm. up to, up to bowel, bowel tolerance if I, I feel sick. And some people take as many as, I mean, one of the protocols for cancer in the alternative community is intravenous vitamin C, where you can take 50,000 of it in a day. Wow. Wow. I've done that, but not now. I haven't done that in a long time. But I've done that. And I take beta glucan, B E T A G L U C A. I've never even heard of that. Okay. Very boasted the immune system, berberin, mm -hmm. B E R I N E. Mm -hmm. So I take every day two, two of those at least. I take for my blood pressure, I take L citrulin for my blood pressure. And also L glutathione, the master vitamin that, is, that governs everything in your body. Um, the master antioxidant is what they call it, glutathione. And I take a liposomal form of, of glutathione, liposomal meaning it's in, in a oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else do I take? Uh, zinc every day and mushrooms. Um, uh, and your, turmeric, your turmeric, 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 turmeric. It's a Vitamin D deficiency can lead and vitamin D, yes, vitamin D. I take a vitamin D, twenty five hundred milligrams a day. Uh, 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 in, I use a day, mm -hmm. twenty five hundred. I use a day. I take vitamin D, yes, yeah, and magnesium. I take every day, but that's for my blood pressure also because I tend to have high blood pressure, so I take magnesium, and it regulates wow. my heartbeat. I had a regular heartbeat in in the early I, late nineties or early two thousands. I I almost fainted on stage once, and um, my blood pressure dropped. I, my heart was skipping; it was irregular, it was 
the skipping beats. Uh -huh. So they did like $30,000 worth of tests in some place in, in Century City. They had me on a centrifuge and whirled me around for a while. <laughs> I don't know what the hell they were doing there. I wore a monitor, heart monitor for a week for 10 days. And um, they thought I might be a candidate for a, um, uh, a regulator. Um, a pacemaker? Huh? A pacemaker? Pacemaker, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pacemaker. And so they did all these tests. And what they found out is I was stressed. Well, I could have told them that. I didn't need $30,000 worth of tests to tell me this. Because I was doing, I was doing for um, LA Unified, mm -hmm. a version of Much Ado About Nothing for schools in Hispanic areas. Wow. East LA Classic Theater. We take them to schools for TYA Theater for Youth mm -hmm. audiences. And so I was doing that in the morning. I get up like five o'clock in the morning to go set up a stage somewhere and either outside, outside somewhere at a school in the, in the barrios. And uh, we would do a Hispanic Mexican version of Much Ado About Nothing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did that. And then sometimes, once in a while, I had a TV job too. Hmm? I do that. <laughs> like a commercial I did during that period. So I had to be on set at nine o'clock in the morning because I got him to say, okay, you can come in at nine. So we'd be done with that show and I'd be go off to a, a set. I'd be late, but I'd get off to the set. And then I was doing a play at night. Wow. So that was ridiculous. That was, that was stupid. How does theater compare for you? I mean, because to me, there's nothing like New York. There's nothing like Broadway, off-Broadway. I've done How is it for you, actor? The, the work is the work is the work anywhere you are. I it mean, doesn't I did, matter. I did a great version of Cherry Orchard with Alfred Molina mm -hmm. at the Odyssey Theater. And Alfred Molina was wonderful as, as Lopaka. I played Gaev. And uh, he, uh, he was brilliant, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. He was a great guy, too, to work with. And so working with him at the Odyssey Theater, a waiver show, a waiver theater. Mm -hmm. We weren't paid much, seven dollars a performance. That's all we were paid. But the work is the work. The work is it doesn't the matter same. how much you're paid. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I made you know ten thousand dollars a week on Broadway, but but seven dollars, which is what five shows, eight six shows we did, forty two or seven shows, whatever that was, forty nine dollars a week. <laughs> that's like that's like that's like money in the depression. We made more than that then. Really? Yeah. So what are some of your favorite stage roles that you've played, Greg? Or is there anything that you haven't done that you still would aspire to? I still want to do Lear. I did Lear in 99. I was young enough to carry a, uh, a, a um, I was young enough to carry that. Um, God, I'm out of my mind. I swear to God. Cordelia. Because when I got the job, I mm -hmm. said to them, Look, I want a thin Cordelia. I don't want to overweight Cordelia. Make sure she's thin. Really? <laughs> and they did get me one. As a matter of fact, they had called me about it. And I said, no, no, I want, a, I want a, somebody I can carry. Thank you very much. I don't want to have to wheelbarrow her out. <clears throat> so yeah, I did Lear in 99 in, in Oklahoma City wow. at the uh, Center Theater there. It was great fun. Uh, I worked, we worked on it. I worked on it for almost two about eight or nine months before I did it. So once I did that, I thought, well, I can die now. It's okay. I can die now. I did Lear. But I'm thinking about going to maybe doing it again in New York. I'm thinking about it. I've been looking at it lately and may want to do it again. So we'll see. What, what are, you've worked with amazing people. Anybody stand out? Like, did you do something with Richard Burton? Did you work with Richard Burton? I did. Yes, I did. Did a, a movie called Ray on Rommel. <laughs> he owed Universal uh, a picture. Uh huh. So Henry Hathaway directed it. Henry Hathaway at that time had a had a cholesterol, and he was mean as hell. Wow. He was very mean. Yeah, he was angry about his cholesterol. I think colostomy, whatever you want to call it, colostomy. I think the pronunciation. So um, we did this in Mexico in, in San Felipe, a little fishing village on the Sea of Cortez, 
on the the eastern shore of the Sea of Cortez, Sea of Cortez, and across the way was Puerto Vallarta. And Richard Burton, this is 1971, it was, yeah, or 70, 70 or 70, 70. And Richard Burton was doing Night of the Iguana in Puerto Vallarta. And Elizabeth Taylor was there. Wow. So we we had to wait in San Diego because they had to bribe Mexicans at the border to take tanks into Baja. <laughs> We were traveling as a company. Then we bring down all this equipment down to San Felipe. It was a little fishing village at that time, 134 miles away from my telephone. Wow. And the very first day, I remember, we weren't supposed to have roommates, but we did. This was not in a sad contract. You get your own place. Mm -hmm. And anyway, make a long story short, I played five parts in that because one of Burton's entourage was in the movie and wanted to play my role. And I made the mistake of staying in, of, of the very first or second day of, of shooting. I used the word Alexandria and I said, Alexandria. And, this, and British don't pr pronounce it that way, Alexandria. I made a big mistake and I was caught and they took me out of that role. Oh. Which I was gonna be right by Burton during the whole film. Wow. And, because he was a tank commander. So anyway, they took me out of that role and Henry Hathaway apologized to me. But because his friend, Burton's friend, wanted to play that part, he got the part. Mm. So I had vowed to the uh, superior influence. Um, and I played five parts in that movie. I played a German, a couple of Germans, and three uh, Englishmen and a Welshman. So I got residuals for five wow. characters rather than just one. So I made a lot of money on that movie. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and what so was I, it like? Okay. What was it like to work? I mean, that was like the heyday of of Taylor and Burton, no? <clears throat> yes, and and Elizabeth Taylor came over. They, they built they built that landing uh, uh, runway for her, and she came over in a DC three, I think it was two engine plane, came over, landed, and they built a complex for her and Burton there, cinder block, of course. Mm -hmm. And we used to go sit in, this, in one little cafeteria there, one little restaurant, little place. There's nobody else around. And sat back and drank with them and ate with them, sat right next to Elizabeth and Richard right there, drank with Richard at the time. Never, I got drunk. The worst I have ever gotten drunk in my life. I bet it would we be. We were drinking mezcal. Oh, God. Yeah. In this little bar they had there. Mm -hmm. And I'm drinking with Burton. And all of a sudden, I, I went to go to the bathroom and the floor hit me. The floor came up and hit me right in the face. Oh, I went down and passed out. And I recovered very, very rapidly, but my friend took me to my place. And uh, I never drank mezcal ever again in my life. <laughs> drank the worm. Wow. Was never wow. again, never again. You know, I, we were talking about Natalie Wood and then you told the Jennifer Jones story. And I'm not sure you told the Natalie Wood story on the air of what happened. Well, because, because I didn't even start to tell it. Because you didn't ask me about it. We, we, we discussed this before we went on. <clears throat> well, that story is this. Doing Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. Uh -huh. We had a scene in which Robert Culp, myself, Elliot Gould, and all others assembled in Hollywood. Um, we're in this group. And we had a group hug. And we were supposed to cry in that hug. We were all crying. And that was the reason why we gave each other hugs. And it came to a close-up of Natalie Wood. And she went... Fred, Fred. And I wondered, everybody looked at her like, what is she doing? And this makeup guy came over and blew ammonia in her eyes, a little tube. And she started to cry. Tears came up. And the other actors went through their contortions and conniptions to get, you know, <laughs> cried, did a preparation, all this stuff, cried, myself included. And, uh, <laughs> but she was a girl, a, a young child actor. Mm -hmm. So she was used to pretending to cry and not really crying because it wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. And you would not know to this day that she wasn't crying. Real really? Tears. You wouldn't know. So she was so good. She was good, so good at that. Even though she didn't do the internal approach and come she from. Did not. You still, you wouldn't know. And she may have been more risable than she thought, but she didn't need to be because it wasn't part, part of Hollywood. You do that, you know. So um, I've seen people do it on soap operas too. 
Oh, I've really? People do it on soap opera. Some. You worked on the bold and the beautiful. How? Yeah. So after doing this soap opera spoof, like the greatest of all time, Mary Hartman, Mary but Hartman. I'd, I'd done the bold and beautiful, I think, before I did Mary Hartman, or maybe after. No. I guess it was after. No, after. It was after, yeah. Yeah. It had to be strange after spoofing it to actually do the real thing. No, I don't, I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> no. no, no, because no, because you don't, you know, it's not spoof. Yeah. It's not a spoof. And we didn't approach Mary Hartman as a spoof in the sense that we, we knew we were spoofing. We approached right. it as real of because course. that's the best thing to do. It's like playing farce. You play farce just up in the stakes and farce will work. I mean, on Broadway, I did, I did um, Rumors. On Broadway, played the lead mm -hmm. uh, on, in Rumors. And uh, it's a farce, you know, Simon Farce. Mm -hmm. But you play it for real because you just, it's overemphasized, that's all. And maybe vocally stronger. And certainly, but the play is written that way. So you play the play as if it were really, really real. It's like doing Love. You know the play Love by Mary uh -huh. Sisko? Uh -huh. You play that really, really real. And it's funny. I believe so. Because when people I argue about, inane things it's funny it is funny and the stakes are high but the, what you're talking what you're arguing about is not is pretty inane you so know? when you started and you were studying with nicholson and and keitel and uh, uh I, 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 yeah i didn't say harvey keitel oh i was, thought was, who was no. in that it was nicholson who else was in your your group of sue lyons okay uh, um Lindel Cristal, Linda Cristal. Mm -hmm. um, Pat Harrington was in the group. Pat Harrington. And could you a, tell that? Eric. Did you see the talent back then in all of those people? Well, the most talented guy was not was not Jack. It was a guy named Bruce Mars, I thought. And um, um, he became an, a, a monk. Wow. SRF, Self-Realization Fellowship Monk. Wow. Because he had auditioned. He'd done a screen test for Paramount for something and he didn't get it and he was devastated. <clears throat> so he decided to become a monk and he's happier, happier than anybody. Wow. So I heard you tell a story about Nicholson, how he was not the first choice for Easy Rider. Do you have a story about that? Well, in the sense that, that having gone, I, I had, I had uh, dinner once with uh, Dennis Hopper Mm -hmm. um, Harry, Harry Dean Stanton, Bruce Mars, that guy I told, I told you about, mm -hmm. myself. I don't, can't remember who else was there. Um, at, at, at Melrose. And this was before I was going to go to Eric Morris's acting class. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, he talked about, um, I forget who the hell he had in mind to do this movie. I think I'm going to do this movie, man. You know, yeah, I mean, um, Dennis Hopper, um, and I'd been to Dennis's house, and he was talking about this movie he was going to do. Maybe out in the desert, man, produce movie, you know, like I mean, and and Rip Torn, I doesn't want to do it. I don't know who I'm going to cast. I don't know, you know, and and Ted talked about maybe somebody else would do it, and so lo and behold, he wasn't the first choice. Rip Torn was the one that he wanted, right? Well, that's the one he, he was thinking of at the time. He may have been thinking about other people too, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to be in it. Although, had I, had, I, had I tried to be in it, I probably would have, but I, Dennis is pretty crazy in those days, you know? And I didn't know if he was going to do that or not. And, and I wasn't a great friend of his. I knew him and I'd been to his house a couple of times. His house was pretty bizarre. He had this big Chevrolet, uh, 1955, I think it was, Chevrolet Impala billboard in his backyard. A huge billboard. And a, he, had a up, he had a big ceiling, big high ceiling. And he had this big paper mache clown, gargantuan thing, about 12 foot, maybe 10 foot long, long and wide up on the ceiling, hung from the ceiling. So he had bizarre things. He had, his bathroom was weird, little guest bathroom was very strange. Uh, pictures. He was a photographer. Mm -hmm. So he liked to take, um, what shall I say, risque pictures of people doing um, risque things. Uh -huh. I, leave it that, okay? <laughs> I love it. He, was, he, was, he used to go to the Paris house, mm -hmm. on, which was on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard 
in West Hollywood at the time before West Hollywood was was what it is today. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be an actors bar called the Check the Brain Check Room on, on Santa Monica, where actors would go and you'd see on the board who was working that week, etc. It was a great playing out. I used to go there all the time for actors. John Cassavetes hung out there a lot. Wow. But anyway, those were the back in the days in the, in the late 60s, 70s. So you've studied with so many different people when you teach. I did. Is, is it a is it a amalgam of all that? It is, it is. I teach, I teach basically Meisner. Doing is very important to me. What are you doing in the scene? What are you doing? What do you want? What are you doing? What are the given circumstances? What's my relationship to the person I'm talking to? What do I want from them? What do I want? And then, because I studied with Lee, mm -hmm. I'm also very interested in what you're feeling mm -hmm. and what's going on with you emotionally. Mm -hmm. And the two kind of come together. And I use the imagination a lot too. I do personalizations too. I learned from Eric and from, from Lee Strasberg. And as ifs, magic ifs, which is, which is Stanislavski. And I also studied with disciples of Michael Chekhov. Well, I never studied with Michael Chekhov, but I like that work a lot. It's all pretty much imagination, which mm -hmm. works a lot. So all those things come together to work, to trying to access parts of you that are right for the character, you know? So pre-COVID, Greg, would you teach a class or was it yes. one -on coach? It was a class. It was a class. Yeah, I had a class. class. And so now, COVID, no more class? Are, are you? I'm not doing classes now. No, no, no classes. But I do. I have taught on Zoom, but I mostly coach on Zoom these days. I coach on Zoom mostly auditions, but I do. I do work with some people. Like I'm working with a young girl, a 14 year old in Kentucky mm -hmm. right now, who aspires to go to NYU and or maybe Juilliard would be nice too. Or, or Yale, <clears throat> School of Drama. But anyway, she's, uh, her problem is that she's worked too much in amateur theater, mm -hmm. local theater, mm -hmm. and she's got to unlearn a lot of stuff. And uh, it's good, the training she has, but she's got to unlearn, that she's got to be able to access herself emotionally more and use her imagination more and not just learn the lines and think she's going to be okay with that. So, but she's 14, so she's got a lot. We're working I, I, on teach an actor about inner life? How do you teach an actor about inner life? Well, the first thing I do, Eric Morris has a great exercise, I think, mm -hmm. called personal inventory to find out what's going on with you right now. Like, for example, I just took a deep breath and I just moved my hands here. Self-awareness, mm -hmm. awareness, awareness about presence, about in the moment. What am I doing right this moment? Well, I'm moving my hands like this. I'm also talking. My mouth is moving. I'm also moving my hand. My head is bobbing a little bit. My shoulder, what have tension anywhere in my body? I wear my body. It's like a meditation in a way. You know, when you meditate, sometimes you may do a mantra, or you may not, but you have to be aware of what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, like I do calm mostly every day. I do one of those. I do too. I love, Jeffrey, calm. I love Jeffrey Warren. Me too. Yes. Me too. He's great. I like him a lot. Is he so in the moment? He's so. Yeah, very. He's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they'll tell you to soften the jaw or soften the thing, so you're aware of what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. So personal inventory is like that. So you get more or less into what's going on with you mm -hmm. and where you are emotionally that day. Uh, to know what's going on with you. So, like, I start doing this kind of an exercise about four hours, three hours before I go to the theater. Find out, like. Like, what's going on with me today? You know, am I, I, do I feel great? Do I feel not so great? Do I, am I angry? Am I tense? Am I, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I start as part of my preparation. You know? And so I find out what's going on with me today. You know, where am I? You know, and where, where do I have to be when I go on stage, go to do the play? When, um, when do I start entering the world of the play or the world of the, of the script? Do you bring what's going on with you today into your Sometimes, character? Sometimes, yeah, it, it depends. Uh -huh. You know, where's, the, where, where's that character that day? I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know. But I'm playing the character. 
But that would make it really but, interesting if you were bringing your own what's going on today into that character, then that character- It can, it can, but, but mostly not. Mm -hmm. I find out where I am, but then I enter the world of the play mm -hmm. and that begins to meld in with who I am and what, who they are, et cetera, et cetera, my idea. So ideas are important too, how to, how to play the role, mm -hmm. how to, what do I emphasize? What part of me do I want to access to play this guy? Hmm. You know what? Where is he today? Is this character angry? Well, where, I can get. I can do that. You know, you can work work externally. Do that. You can start yelling at somebody in your imagination. You don't have to do that. Or get somebody you know from your past. You're pissed off about somebody you don't like. So there you there you have it. So I'm playing the role. I could be like Daniel Day Lewis though, and do become the become the character and ask my children to call me Mr. President when he played Lincoln. He did that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But you don't have to do that, but he did. It helps him. <laughs> whatever helps the actor. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you, you find out about yourself, the actors got to know have to know themselves extraordinarily well mm -hmm. in order to play a role. Mm -hmm. You have to know what makes you tick in order to, to parallel the emotional life of the character. I think that's true with all art. I think it's true. With, I'm a writer. Yeah. It's also true with musicians. It's I true. Think. It's true. Yeah. And you enter a zone. And with, with all acting technique is about, for me anyway, to enter the zone. A zone is like an athlete. Having played athletics and been a baseball player, I know that when you're in a zone, you don't have to think about what you're doing. You just can. It's like basketball. Some guys at some nights can just make basket after basket after basket. Other nights, not so much. Mm -hmm. That's when you have to rely on technique more. But when you're, when you're flying, you're flying. And the only problem then is when you become, make a comment about what, how well you're doing, it's when you run into trouble. <clears throat> I was doing, I was doing um, uh, uh, a play in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was playing Clarence Darrow. Wow. Uh, and so I remember doing a, a, a scene where I'm talking about the, uh, I have a long speech, let's put it that way. And in the middle of the speech, I'm thinking, man, that was really good. I went, I went up, I went up in a long monologue, I went up. And um, I turned the audience, I mean, the, the, the townspeople were behind me and mm -hmm. I turned around to them and said, I, I'm gone up, does everybody know the line? And there was a teacher from Lancaster who taught high school there, who knew the line. <laughs> Inherit the wind is the name of the play. Inherit the wind. Right. And she gave me the line. And I went on. The audience didn't know because I improvised at the time. When I was doing a Broadway play with Mia Farrow and Tony Perkins, romantic comedy, I was playing Mia Farrow's husband. <clears throat> we opened and we did an out-of-town tryout at a huge theater in Boston. Mm -hmm. Had about 2,300 seats. And... Um, I went up during a speech, and they're both on stage. And I went up, I said, hey, look, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? And I went on and on and on, finally the line came to me. They didn't know, the author knew. Bernie, Bernie oh. Slade was the author knew, he was there that night. He was pissed at me for going up, but I did. You know, it happens to actors on stage. You go up, How was you improvise it? your way out. How was it, uh, did, you, did you ever study improvisation? Did you ever do that? <clears throat> I tried to do that, uh, no, but we did a lot of improvs in, in the Meisner classes that I took. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of improvisations because I had the actors do that, improvise the scene mm -hmm. with your own words. How and then what I do, what I do is I call, I intersperse it with the lines. I have them improvise and then throw the lines in here and there. Mm -hmm. Or improvise on the lines. Make it real. And make it real. And you begin to find a more reality for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. you know? How was it working with Mia? At what stage At what stage of time was that? That was in 1979 and 80. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was pre-Woody or just about Woody? Pre-Woody. Yes. However, I helped her buy a telescope to look across the park. I don't know if she was, I didn't have it. I didn't know why I was buying the telescope. We found one on Broadway, one of those camera stores on Broadway at the time, yeah. there were a bunch of them around. And we found, she bought a telescope. 
and she had her little five-year-old boy with her at the time. And so I, little did I know that she probably looked across the park. She let it know she was looking at Willie Allen's apartment because she was on the Upper West Side of, in the <laughs> 70s. That, that, uh -huh. that apartment her mother had, uh -huh. Maureen Sullivan, from the 30s. Wow. The big seven room apartment. Oh my God, a gorgeous place. And so, <clears throat> and it's a famous building. I can't remember the name of it. I can't remember the name of it offhand. <clears throat> it wasn't the Dakota. She didn't live in the Dakota, did she? Mm, maybe. They I'm not sure. I knew, it was, a, I knew it was a famous building. Dakota, what? They filmed Rosemary's Baby in the Dakota, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Sullivan had had a uh, Sullivan had a uh, had an apartment there that she owned, and Mia had it. So anyway, about two weeks later, up pulls Woody Allen's Rolls Royce to the uh, Barrymore Theater. Off they went to the lanes on the on the east side, where he plays his clarinet. And lo and behold, the rest is history. I remember when she got the girls. You know, well, no kids. Knowing her and having had a uh, professional relationship with her, do you have an opinion on this whole craziness? <clears throat> well, I'm a Mia side because she was she was wonderful to work with and a terrific woman. She was the centerpiece of our gatherings. The cast was the was the uh, the green room for, for us pretty much. Mm -hmm. Her her dressing room. So yeah, I sympathize with her. Um, I mean, it's very strange that one would wind up with a spouse, almost spouse, this child, whether it's her real child um, or not, adopted, of course, but nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I mean, not cool, I don't think. Did you watch that? I, I changed my mind. I used to be a Woody sympathizer, and then I, yeah. I watched Yeah, that. I think that, that documentary I watched, um, I'm trying to think of one of um, Michael's friends that I did a play with. I'm not Michael, Woody's friends, mm -hmm. whose name escapes me at the moment, Michael. Um, anyway, he did a lot of movies with, with Woody. Mm -hmm. And nonetheless, um, he was not a Woody pal anymore mm -hmm. and not on Woody's side. So and they're not friends anymore either, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not gonna say the guy's last name. If you can figure it out, fine, but I'm not going to say it. I, 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 know, I know his name, but I'm not going to say it. Um, nonetheless, um, I tend to be a, be a sympathizer. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm in that camp more. And I know what he, yeah. through, through um, Louise. Louise lives in the apartment, still in New York, that she and Woody had when they were together. Wow. She was married wow. to Woody. That's a long time ago. Long time, 1968. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so you and Louise still do things together, yes? Yes, yeah, I saw Louise about three weeks ago. Um, about, now about five weeks ago, we had brunch together. We brought over a brunch for her. She was just out of the hospital and was in a hospital bed in her apartment. And so we had the brunch on her hospital bed or nearby. All of us gathered around there. My lady made brunch and brought her, we brought it over. Is Louise okay? I hope she's okay. She's not walking well. She's she's got some issues, health issues, and so. But she's in rehab, and she's doing physical therapy all the time, a lot, and she's getting better. So that's good. So now, is it? I saw something online, but I couldn't see the actual yeah. thing where you guys do a scene from Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and then you do it again we're going to do a guy named terry ray whom i've, I've done a play with and worked with before mm -hmm. and then one of his little things that he has on youtube um little pilot that he made and he's going to do he's doing this with people who are on shows like mine like our show and louise and i have both agreed to do it we're going to pretend that we're both again tom hartman and mary hartman <laughs> in a relationship and he's going to talk to us, interview us as those characters as they are now. I love it. <laughs> so we're going to do that. In uh -huh. about, I'll be back in New York in about five weeks. Uh -huh. um, unless I get a job here. And I'm hoping I do. Um, nonetheless, we're going to do this thing for him. 
and we get paid, which is nice. I love it. And right Terry, after contract, so. Terry's wonderful. So our Linda Apsey, who cleaned your teeth, is on. And she <laughs> said, <laughs> Hi, Linda. I need help. <laughs> she said, Maureen O'Sullivan lived at the Langham at 135 Central Park West. That's right. There you oh, go. Now somebody told her, the Langham. That, well, that's where she was. So Linda, it wasn't tell Dakota. us. I didn't think it was the Dakota. you worked for. What? Uh, I'm asking Linda to tell us which doc, which dentist she worked for when you were when she was cleaning her Yeah, I'd be curious to know who. <laughs> That's hysterical. Um, so Greg, yeah. I I, <clears throat> and, uh, I have to say it on the air so he'll know that I didn't forget him, but my friend Andy Sheffman and I literally watched every Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman in reruns together because we were separate. Anyway, we talked on the phone every day about you guys. So I sent him um, a picture and I said, look, my dream coming true. And he said, boy, he looks great for his age because I sent him a picture of you as Tom Hartman. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, but right. It, it, it really is for me so thrilling. I cannot tell you how much joy you imparted, have imparted in my life. Um, just the funniest show that's ever been on television by far. So do you have a preference? You know, you, you're so adept at comedy, but, and yet you do a lot of drama. I do. I do a lot of drama. Yeah. I did a, I did a play in New York called the soap myth. Um, and it is now we, we did it as a, as a film, as a video. It is now in every Holocaust museum in the, in the world. And I'm very proud of it. I play a survivor. In it, I have one of the leads, if not the lead in the play. Wow. Um, and uh, I, I have it on my reel, where I play Milton Saltzman, this old Jew who talks like this. No, <laughs> not quite like that. But that no, it, like but I, you know, accent, I've, I'm from originally from uh, Romania, mm -hmm. but I get, I wound up in Auschwitz. And it's true. And so, um, I'm very proud of the work I did on that. Wow. Ed Asner just recently did a, a reading of it and toured it all over the country playing Milton mm. but as a reading. But I did it as a film and, and video actually, and uh, but cinematic and uh, got a, really nice notices and, and did I think some of my best work in that, in that uh, thing. I have it on my reel. I was going to say that some. I've also played a Nazi general. Can we find that on online? Is that uh, the soap myth? Yeah, you can. I don't know if you can find it online. You might have to go to the museum here, the Holocaust Museum, uh -huh. to see it. But, uh, but um, I'm going to put it on my website pretty soon. Uh, at least part of that scene. Mm. And that's in the on my on my reel. I also have myself playing a German general, not in that play. But in a different piece I did, a film I did called The, the, um, the Desperate mm -hmm. with uh, Peter Mark Richmond mm -hmm. playing a Holocaust victim. I was playing a general, German general who's um, Prussian, who was in as a duty to fight because people were gonna invade our country, Germany, but I wasn't a Hitlerite. I hated Hitler, but nonetheless, I, my son gets mortally wounded and I want this doctor, Peter Mark Richmond, to save him. And I and I on that same reel I had that, so mm -hmm. interesting playing a general a general von Ulbricht. That's a German, you know, talking like this. And then I ask him to heal my son to work on him, and I beg him to to do what he vowed not to do, help the Germans. But he does relent as a physician and does it. But he's a, he's a, so I on that reel I have. That and then the Holocaust victim too, and the Holocaust survivor, has played two different, very different roles. How do you think on dialect? Did you study dialect when you were? No, I, I think if you have a good ear, I have a good ear because when I, I was a kid, I used to do dialects. My friends and I used to walk in New York on the street and doing dialects, pretending we were English, pretending we we're, you know. And I, I was actually with Meredith once during the the. Um, Miss World Contest, I think it was in Britain. And uh, we were at a party. And I pretended I'd gone to, uh, I wanted to practice my British accent. Mm -hmm. And I told people I had been to Cambridge. I, I went to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I talked like a posh accent, talk like this, you see. 
<laughs> all very, very posh. And so I pretended I was, uh, and then another time I pretended I was Cockney talking to some Brits who thought I was from, from East, the East, East End. Talking like this, you know, like, if you wish to speak, right, Michael Caine, say no more than three words at a time. <laughs> you're really excellent at it. Has anybody ever busted you? Because you're really good at it. Um, no. Has no, it, I, I never got busted either, but they, I got, they got suspicious though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> at the posh, at the posh thing, because of Cambridge, you know, because he started to ask me questions. I remember one time going in for an Australian, mm -hmm. you know, mate, you talk more like that. Well, what's up, mate? <laughs> right? Australian beer. <laughs> so I remember going in for the part and they asked me where I was from. I said, I'm from Perth. What part of Perth? I said, well, I'm from the east side of Perth. Really? You know what this street? Yeah. Because I used to live on that street. You know what it is? Well, I'm, I'm dead. I'm dead in the water. I, I said, okay, okay. Game up. Game up. And I didn't do a very good Australian accent at the time. I started, started to sound like I was an East Ender. <laughs> East End accent. One time I did a, a, a TV show called The Guns of Will Sonnet. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, if I could do a Welsh accent, I said yes. Because Strasbourg always used to say, say yes, and then go learn. Right. And all I did was learn. In those days, you couldn't go on the internet and find, listen right. to it. You had to make it up. And I heard that they were kind of sing-songy, which they're really not the Welsh. But they didn't know any better. The American producers didn't know any better. The director didn't. I, did, I got the part, and I played it. Nice. nice. So over your shoulder, Greg, I'm seeing your dad in his baseball uniform. Um, yes. And... Did your parents get to see you have success? And did, did they, were they happy for the kind of success you had? My parents, my parents were very pedestrian in their tastes, I'm afraid. Um, <clears throat> they both, my mother was born in the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan. My father was born in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> they didn't quite get Mary Hartman because they didn't have a laugh track. They didn't know if they should laugh or not. They liked my success, but they didn't like, they didn't love the show. Let's put it that way. Okay. They were tolerant, you know, so. <laughs> well, it was really out. But there. they were very proud of me. There's no question about it, you know. You yeah. Know? But I was, you know, I was growing up, my father was like my hero, you know. Growing up, I'd go to baseball games. I was like a bat boy when I was seven years wow. old. Yeah. I mean, come on. That was great for a kid growing up. Baseball. And I still love baseball. Big Dodger fan. Will be forever, Dodger blue. I know you're a, you're a Reds. No, you're a Yankee fan. The Yankees are doing quite well this year, by the way. They're gonna they're ahead of the Red Sox did now. Did you see the Field of Dreams game last week? By the way, I did not. You know, I, it's on I was the, on a plane. I'm gonna send you a little link. It I, it's not the whole game, but it's what they did at the beginning, and it's really beautiful to see. I guess the, the Cincinnati and some other team are gonna play next year. And the same thing, oh, the same really? But the, the game itself was, it was crazy. a sensational crazy. game. I know, Yankees I wish I had well, seen except it. Except for the Yankee fans, the uh, very end was not and the Yankees won. No, oh, no the, White, the White Sox won. I'm sorry, the Yankees lost. But the I'm very won. pleased with that outcome, nonetheless, yes. you are not. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. I've never loved I, the Yankees. I, never, I would never go to Yankee Stadium when I was in New York. I wouldn't go. How, how long was your dad with the Dodgers? Till, till what time frame was your dad uh, coaching the Dodgers? Through the whole Walter Alston era. From 1958 until he died. He was with the Dodgers. Not as a coach necessarily, but with the Dodgers until he died. Which was when? 34 years. Wow. 34 years with the Dodgers. Wow. But all through the Alston era, they won, what, three championships during his time? Wow. I have the 1963 wow. World Series ring I have where the, the Dodgers beat the Yankees four straight. Koufax won two games. Oh, my Hello. God. Hello. Four straight so and beat the Yankees. You went to a lot of baseball games, didn't you? I have, yeah. Wow. And I loved every minute. My mother and I used to go. My mother and brothers. I have three brothers. Do you have a baseball hero other than your father? Lou Boudreau was a hero of mine. Um, Gil Hodges was a hero of mine. Pee Wee Reese was a hero of mine. Um, yeah. 
And you got to meet all those guys? Well, Sandy Koufax. Oh. Yes, oh. I got to meet Koufax for sure. And John oh. Drysdale, I like John Drysdale a lot too. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, what a great upbringing you had. And what a I wonderful did. life. I and did. I think I've had I, a great I, life. I, I don't regret any part of it. Over a hundred plays and you're not slowing down. Is there- is, No, I'm not. So is there a company that you're associated with in New York or you just, you audition and go where the work is? I go where the work is. I'm not associated with a company in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I was a member of Pacific Resident Theater when I was here in LA. I love that. I love Pacific Resident Theater. I love them. They're, they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love their work. I love what they do. They have three theaters there on, on Venice Boulevard in, uh, in uh, Venice. Well, I hope you get that part on Bosch because I'll, I'll be up to I that. do too. I, I'll be up but to if I that. don't, you know what? I tell actors, okay, it hurts a little bit. Next, next. Yeah. You know, and thank God you're alive. I do gratitude uh, meditation every day. I try to do gratitude every day, twice a day if I can. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's the secret to being happier. You know, if you dwell on, on the losses you think you've had in your life, you're going to be in big trouble. Depression right around the corner. And actors have to be wary of that, you know, because you don't get a part you like. It's very frustrating. You know, competition is very fierce. And it's hard. If you, if you want to be a movie star, the odds are, the odds are very, very much, much against doing, being, having that happen. Mm -hmm. But the work, the work is always the place to put your heart onto as a way to begin and, and go through your life that way. I think you're much better off. I love that, Greg, and I adore you, and I'm so grateful to you for doing this. It's been absolutely a thrill for me to sit down with you for this time and have- Well, I've heard about you for a long time, and you're more beautiful than I even thought you were. Oh. And, and you. Your pictures do you somewhat justice, but just in person, you're so much prettier than that. And inside, oh, you're great too. So there. You know what I have to tell people? You were so lovely. Uh, to my ex, uh, had posted something about his father. You know, his father was a philosophy professor at NYU, uh, Razzie mm -hmm. Labelson, and he had posted something about. I don't know if it was his mother is was a survivor. She was the um, a Jewish nurse in the in the wait. She was the head nurse at the Jewish hospital in Berlin during the war and she survived. Anyway, he did some post and you wrote something really beautiful to him and it really, really moved him. And it touches me that you are, I mean, it shows in your art and in your work, but the fact that you carry that through on a public platform like Facebook is, um, it's just beautiful. You're just a special person. And I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to to chat with you and get to know you. And Tom Hartman knows me. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. It's fabulous. Okay. It's fabulous. Well, I look forward to more of you. Thank you so much for doing this, Greg. Have a my wonderful, pleasure. wonderful rest of your stay. And um, if it's not this part, it'll be the next. I can't wait to see yep. more. Next, next, next. There you go. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Vicki. God bless.